sure I'm, I got enough coffee, you'll find out. Um, so first of all, do you know that uh, UC Marseille is known as UC Berkeley Junior? The reason is that uh, Marseille is uh, the only campus using the semester uh, system in addition to um, Berkeley, because we want to be synchronized with Berkeley. So. All right, I'm running a drone lab, but I don't use that. I use Mectronics, okay? So Mectronics. So um, Sudip told me just a few days ago, uh, add gas sensing in there. I thought he's going to give me 40 minutes, so but um, I only have 25, so I'll discipline myself. I use timer here. So um, uh, Sudip was impressed by a professor like us. Uh, we know that uh, we are the international level of beggar, the money from everywhere. Uh, so that's our job. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank uh, Sudip and Claire for organizing this event. So I got a chance to share some of our work with you. So here's an outline. Um, uh, so uh, first, what is low-cost small UAVs? Well, I share with you my understanding, and I'm going to share with you a personal remote sensing. Why we add personal in front of remote sensing, and what's the consequence of that? Then after that, that I will share uh, two applications, like in the title, gas sensing and precision air. Finally, I will share with you uh, concluding remarks regarding uh, what is still publishable, stuff like that. So students, you don't want to leave now. Uh, wait until I share with you this uh, remarks in the end. So uh, let me see. I drove here. I get up at 5:30, and from here and drive on the road six departure time, arrival 9:40. So it's totally unexpected. I never late like that. So sorry, I missed the first speaker so almost. So you know that we're in the Central Valley is the hub of the agriculture. We grew things, okay, grew things. And we are very near to everywhere, just two hours away. And uh, so, and you know that we have a citrus in the northern part of uh, California and South Cal, we have five campus, five, five. Makes sense, right? So I want to impress you by showing you that uh, all our, uh, so, um, we have $1.3 billion spending right now and building the campus, so I'm going to show you next. So I want to emphasize these two numbers. These two numbers make me feel like my lifespan got relatively extended. The reason is I'm creating relatively larger impact to those poor kids and creating a lot of opportunities for them. So like um, over 200 students across my uh, lab gain a research experience. I find a job. So this is 2020. So we have 1,500 more parking spaces, uh, 1,700 more beds. So those numbers are very impressive. Okay, 1.3 billion dollars spending, and we have 13 new buildings going to be delivered by 2020. We already have three buildings uh, delivered in August. So I'm now teaching a course, nonlinear control, uh, in the new building. Okay. Let me see, you're reading somewhere here, okay. So this is a quick one. So you can see our ranking is going up. So our ranking is going up and uh, just to impress you that uh, we are in the top 100 in the public school. Uh, nationwide, our private and the public, we are ranked at 136. This is impressive. So people didn't realize that we are that good, okay. Um, my lab in one slide is just showing you that we do mechatronics. So the courses I teach, mechatronics, fractional, uh, fractional mechanics for, under, uh, for graduate students, now in the control for graduate students, 200 level, and I uh, had an unmanned error system. So, so uh, our research emphasis is unmanned error system and UAV based personal remote sensing. We do cyber physics system, mechatronics, applied fractional calculus. Um, don't get me started on that topic. So, modeling of control of renewable energy systems. So, uh, right now I have six PhD working in the lab and over 10 plus visiting scholars work on the energy, water, and precision ag, environment, environmental monitoring. And here it is a digital heritage. So, so I'm, I've been trying to paint a big picture about the synergy and the MRPI. I'll still keep trying. 
But this makes sense for our northern uh, campus uh, dominated. So we have UC Davis, Merced, and uh, Berkeley also. Uh, we have uh, Santa Cruz, and we try to pen this one at the drone level, admission level, operational level, certification level, and application level here, precision ag and environment, environmental monitoring. So Sudip asked me to have one slide to show uh, drones activities from the UC Marcel. There's a lot of uh, synergies on campus already. So uh, Mesa Lab is my lab. We do moni uh, environmental monitoring and we do water drones, check water quality, and we do uh, we do um, uh, plume tracking and do um, methane sniffing, precision agriculture, digital heritage, cave drone. So we also have a teaching like from student club to uh, design, build, and fly, AIWA and engineering service learning for juniors and sophomore. And also we have a formal uh, technical elective course on drones. And I promote a lot of uh, UAS for STEM activities. Like even this morning, the kids are visiting my, 60 kids are visiting my uh, lab. So we also have another uh, group called Search Aviation, and here we have a representative here. They also do ag environment monitoring, especially they develop extension of UAS training course for general public. And uh, we have a short social science and school of social science. They do a digital heritage, archaeology, and Mayan cave exploration drone work. So it's very exciting. And uh, last but not least, actually very important, Brandon Stark. Doug Stark is running the center, uh, offering engineering service learning. He's here, and uh, he's also building a niche like drone test course. So come to my our uh, our, our campus to play on um, this NIST course soon. And he's also doing research on the Venerable Reserve Dynamics. Also, he's right now teaching the drone course, so I don't have to. Great. So what is, uh, so let's come back um, to the topic. What is a low cost of small uh, UAV? Um, my definition is, is comparable to iPhone X, thousand level. So not more than that. And the weight is, uh, of course, takeoff weight is 55 pounds, can be fixed wing, rotor wing, and hybrid. But as a control guy, electronics person, drones to me is nothing but some sort of mobile sensing platform for scientific data and a mobile actuation platform that you do crop dusting or you do shipping something, move something from A to point A to point B. So that kind of, so the drone itself has to be cheap and do useful things. So we start this notion, low cost notion, from the very beginning. So people laughed at, laughed at us when I first joined the competition in 2008, using this fly wing and do autonomous work. And we won the second place, impressed everybody. So, uh, so low cost works. And uh, then next year we go there again and we won number one. And then we, we went again, and we won number one again, then we stopped. So it's getting boring. And <laughs> so, so that shows the concept of if things can be very affordable. Um, the remote sensing can be down at the personal level. What will happen if we put personal in front of computing or computer in 1950? People will laugh at you also. Right? But today, we take it already for granted. It should be personal. So, and we generate the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. So just imagine you put the person in front of remote sensing. What will happen? We'll produce Bill Gates and Steve Jobs like okay, some of you might be. I don't want to elaborate it here and just too much. Just give you a flash uh, view of one of the platforms my former uh, PhD student is still doing in, in, in Utah is called Calvin Cookman. So this platform, okay, can fly 200 minutes with 200 miles range, can cover 20,000 acres, okay, 200 minutes, okay, and maximum weight on 26 pounds, takeoff weight, and payload is 5 pounds. This is impressive, very impressive. And I have two sets of meaning in my lab. 
when I left in 2012. So that one is a one hour, 50 miles version, okay? So this is the current personal remote sensing platform cap capacity, capabilities you can see. So I need to go a little bit quicker about my uh, uh, applications. One is gas sensing, one is precision ash. So gas sensing, I think you know why this is important, why PGNE is willing to spend money on this because um, you know they have like uh, 42,000 miles of natural gas distribution pipeline and the transmit so there are two types transmission versus distribution and 60,000 miles of uh, transmission pipeline to check the integrity the health the small leak so by the way you know that they, they lose money every year millions if not billions to the small leak that you cannot discover in time okay uh, so PGE has the second largest gas transmission and distribution system in the United States. Uh, so uh, they have a 70,000 square miles service area. And then they do the uh, personal uh, on-ground checking and using aircraft, manned aircraft, and using vehicles. So the spending on this checking service, a lot of money every year. So. If we don't do a good job, then you will see that uh, this disaster can remind you that uh, it's important. So um, for early detection of leaks, small leaks especially, we call it fugitive methane detection using drones. So in addition to this type of um, big disasters, we also have uh, the natural disasters. Then after uh, everything is gone, then can you just turn on the gas pipeline? Do you want to do it? It's dangerous, right? So if you don't have a way to check whether there's it's a leaking. So also you need a uh, drone service on that because there isn't a road maybe, so you have to use drone. So our project background is based on the Mars rover. They, uh, they have a payload to do the Mars atmosphere um, scientific payload. And specifically, we have one thing called tunable laser spectro uh, spectrometer uh, using a, a semiconductor uh, laser. And so that is the final uh, version. You can see this is a hand. So we put this one in the drone, so then we can submit. But this is very difficult. This is a very difficult problem, you know. You are disturbing our environment by the by the, uh, uh, the, the propellers, and you are trying to sniff, so what is the what is the arrangement of the sensor so you can do uh, the proper sensing. So that's uh, what we did, <laughs> applicability and decide uh, what is the downwashing behavior and how we can put the sensors properly in an optimal way. So this is supported by pg &E for a two years project and we figure out how to do the integration. We did a lot of ground truth work. So. Now, our mission is try to improve the surveillance effort for the small leaks, okay, fugitive methane through the UAV crypto with the open pass uh, laser uh, spectrometer. So um, then we hope to do the real time feedback to the users, and uh, we need to follow all the regulatory requirements, make sure we don't violate uh, the FAA rules, so that we capture the data we. We try to answer three types of questions. One is where and how much. And uh, when you do the measurement, how confident you are on this. So our initial stage right now is focused on this source localization. We assume the source we do not know. Of course, we do not know the source. Sometimes you know the source, but you don't, do not know the grade. So you need to quantify that for the flux. So it's a difficult problem, even for the simplest localization. Uh, so. so there are past works, like uh, me and Professor Kevin Moore in 2004, we figured out uh, uh, moving sensor networks, moving actuator networks, and uh, try to do the radiative plume, how to map it. And, uh, and in the Spears, uh, Beer and uh, William Spears, and they, their group in Wyoming did a lot of uh, tracing work, okay? And uh, 
right now our job is to try to identify unknown source okay okay unknown source uh, with probably known wind you can measure that so this source seeking appears to be a very difficult research problem and so we formed a special interest group and we document some of the progress there so you can find that so but right now our uh, emphasis is to put uh, machine learning in work so um, to uh, do the optimal method missing um, using the raw uh, time varying data stream and also previously acquired information. So I would like to share with you this is largely an ongoing research effort. So what's done so far and uh, what's to be done? So I want to share with you briefly. Uh, first of all, using UAS, small UAS, uh, VTOL or fixed ring, or we already did uh, nice work. Uh, we have a GUI, we can do brute force scanning, wind operator in the loop type of searching, and we even form the service workload, and my former student even started a company to do the work. So that's done part. But the question is, um, if you want to talk in the scientific level, so we need more work on ground shooting, okay? And I hope that um, there's a way to do the virtual test field, so you reduce the number of real field uh, mission. That's a lot of work, bring the cylinder, bring the bottle, methane bottle there, and the control release, lots of work in logistics, okay? So uh, another part is regarding um, when you are not close to the source, so what you see is just a stochastic packet of the methane. Uh, so what, how you can infer from the stochastic uh, detections to, uh, to find the source? So we need a systematic way to study the source seeking algorithm. So, uh, what if you have uh, multiple leaks and you have a uh, drone swarm, or multiple drones, so how to do the best task assignment collectively to decide where is the leak or multiple leaks. And flux, uh, flux quantification <coughs> of grading of leak events and how we can uh, make our uh, search method um, compatible to the OTM 33A in the UTS menu. So that's the uh, next step. So I have another good news to tell you that uh, for uh, this uh, sniffer we have from the JPL is only one species. Okay, so it's only for methane. It can be configured into ethane, but um, we have a Honeywell gas sniffer sensor array can do multi-species. Uh, uh, I remember it's customari customizable and if you do programming. So um, the single array sensor module uh, can be fit in the small payload. So we are going to do the work in the spring next year. And uh, thank you um, for this. Um, so I would like to say that this will enable huge amount of research opportunities like multi-species gas sniffer on the multiple uh, drones. Now what is the optimal swarm or biosensing strategy? And because everybody sees in different way how you make a deep consensus. Okay, so these are all opportunities for us. So I need to go quicker, five minutes. So I saw that. Precision act, okay, precision act is a triple R, basically all SSM. Uh, so you use water, pesticide, fertilizers, uh, the right place, right amount, the right time. So I want to quickly show you that the hike of the drones. So in five years ago, for the first time, drone into the top five uh, technology list, and everybody is excited about it. And then, and second year, and drone comes to first place. So uh, look at this, um, the 2015 then and become uh, last place again what's on the first data okay people realize that so so uh, I would like to share with you uh, one very quick um, mission we did so so this is uh, oh uh, this is. yeah so uh, do you see this is the matrix <laughs> I see matrices okay I see matrices so these are the uh, near infrared band this is a visible band this is a thermal band so, uh, so you have a, a field with different genetic lines. So uh, we want to do the phenotyping to find out who performs the best. Okay, and uh, so this one can increase the throughput of the screening of the genes. So basically, I would like to say uh, this is um, from data to decision to action to data. This is a spiral circle 
uh, all the time, uh, spiral, uh, okay, all the time. So agriculture is a uh, um, bigger closed loop system, I would like to say that. So it's a cyber physics system for sustainability. So you have so you have a UAV as a moving sensor, instruct the moving actuator to the central pivot. Then you can combine with all the constraints in here, so you make sure um, the crops here are happy and productive. So reflecting here is agriculture is a big data industry. So the key is no longer how to make the drones fly nicely, is to make optimal sense of the sense of big data. So I love what Brad just shared, saying that drones are the edge devices. Wow, that's so beautifully said. So thank you. So I marked the time stamp in here. So <laughs> feel free to cite, to quote. So uh, this is exactly the true. Uh, we did uh, like uh, tree counting, we did um, uh, melon counting. So just imagine that uh, if you, without deep learning, um, this type of work it takes four years, and uh, we even have very romantic applications about flowering dynamics. There's only one week window. We want to see how the uh, the blossom going, uh, evolving, and then they decide where to put more promoters of growth, such that they will harvest uh, one harvest will uh, so one uh, uh, harvest will be enough. Otherwise, you send multiple teams of people harvesting, increase the cost. So this is a very interesting topic. Another work we did is water stress quantification for the almond tree. And uh, I, I have five, four years of data here, and please feel free to ask me. You don't have to fly and get the data, do the ground truth, and compare. I already did all of this in the past four years. I can share the data with you. Uh, you can join the competition, see uh, whether your, your method can work better than us or not. So quantification of water stress for the almond tree. This is our project with UCNR. Another one is very important, I believe, is um, drones for the biochar. So you have a biochar, you apply it in the field, so to see uh, how the crops respond. In this case, it's onion. Um, so the question is, before and after you apply the biochar, so we can use the drones to do the documentation, check the soil variability, and apply the, 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 the biochar nicely and uniformly. That you don't have to be uniform, it's a variable rate. Okay? So uh, I suggest this big picture and uh, in our state of California having a health, so health soil program is, so the drone will help to design incentives and policy that. So why I'm interested in this one is because we have 100 million dead trees right now. Okay? Think about what's going to happen with all these dead trees. So we turn this one in biogasification, do gasification, turn this one into biochar, and we pilot biochar and forming this closed loop stream cycle. Agriculture produce biomass, then you gasification does the biochar, apply it to the soil, and then you get a water efficiency, and you have, uh, uh, you can produce energy, you have better air quality, you don't burn, and you better uh, groundwater quality as well. So everything is plus, okay, everything is plus. To design a policy, you need a drone to come in to tell in quantitative ways called M and V, measurement and verification. So this is a big picture. Can you know? I can still work on this one for the next ten years. So okay, final slide. Okay, four seconds. So um, UAV have many applications, only limited by our imagination. So it's getting harder to be publishable. And, uh, but you have to focus on new payload ideas to have new applications enabled. Swarm development, smart sensing and actuation, cyber physics systems, all these put together can make you more publishable. Putting human factor safety training certification, UTM, UTM, UTK. So I would like to add ag UTM. So for the agricultural use, UTM should be different. Okay, should be different. So I hope there will subcommittee on that, and I can help. And next big thing I believe is surgical spraying that uh, you use uh, least possible uh, pest uh, pesticides to get the pest under control. So I call this the crop dusting 2.0 without people in the cockpit. So thank you very much.
for giving me the opportunity to share with you. Okay. So, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, I have a, a small agricultural venture in Central Washington, um, and. Um, this past season, we had some infestation of uh, 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 um, flea beetles. Okay. Uh, and also fungus. Okay. Um, and I have a few drones. Um, none of them detected either one of these <laughs> situations going on. It was a human detection. But I'm interested in the software that, it, if it's out there, and we could to monitor for um, both the fungus. And insects, um, particularly in relationship to vineyards. Vineyards. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm more expert on um, almond, um, but um, for vineyards, um, I didn't have a chance to really work on a real project. But I know I can do it. So let's talk about it. But the idea is similar. You need to check the variability, meaning. If it is very uniform, means everything is good. There's some big variability. There's something wrong. Okay. So um, detection, especially detecting is easy. Okay, detecting is easy, but early detection is hard. Okay, so our job is how to make early detection. So in that case, I believe the canopy and type of remote sensing may not be enough. You need to combine with proximate sensing. I think our colleague is here is the expert on approximate sensing. So combined ground vehicle and air vehicle probably is the way to go. So you need somebody scouting the robotically scouting it and also fly over it and combine it, have a deep consensus. Yeah. So th this is uh, information you can take a picture if you want. Uh, so uh, next year hopefully you will be there at the US conference. It's the important conference there. And if you are in the robotics society, uh, you, you know that there's a TC on the UAV, so this is I, I'm stepping down this year, so I did six years, you know. So. And we have a very nice TC, uh, sorry, this is of type now, TC um, website. And, uh, and finally, uh, this piece of information is regarding handbook, so we were coming out of another version in 2020. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much.